Hi everyone, I'm Pat Prokop in the Heavenly Backyard Garden. Now, at the end of December through early January, one of my favorite deep space targets uh, is the Rosette Nebula. It fits perfectly right here in the Heavenly Backyard Garden. However, I've been taking several pictures in broadband, which shows a beautiful rosette, uh, a, a, a pinkish red color, and, and, and that in itself is great. But what about narrowband? Uh, going in with the hydrogen alpha, the sulfur 2, and the oxygen 3. What does all that mean? What is narrowband versus broadband? Hi, welcome to Heavenly Backyard Astronomy. You know, we didn't escape that cold wave. It hit us hard, too. Uh, temperature here in Savannah dropped down in the Heavenly Backyard Garden to 19 degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus. 7.2 for all you Celsius fans. And the, the wind chill was like 10 degrees. It was a very cold. And of course, my beautiful poinsettias that I have back over there, which were just beautiful last week. <laughs> yeah, look at the difference. Last week, now today. Now, the telescope that I used was the Orion Eon, a 130 millimeter refractor. It's a triplet. And it's sitting on the Skywatcher EQR6 mount. And this is the camera that I use. It's the ZWO ASI 1600MM Pro. And I had it cooled to minus 10 degrees Celsius, which didn't take much effort at all with these cold temperatures over the last several nights. Now, instead of using the reducer that comes with the Eon, well, you special ordered uh, with the Eon, uh, made for the Eon, uh, which is 0.8x reducer, to be quite honest with you, it's, it's a bit of a pain to put on. But this is the actual reducer uh, for the Eon 130mm telescope. However, it's a pain to put on. You have to take off this whole back assembly, uh, unthread it, and then put this on, and then rethread it back on. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't be so difficult if I didn't have my focuser, uh, automatic focuser connected to the system. This whole system has to uh, come off before I can put on the reducer. But I had this other reducer for my smaller telescope, the uh, uh, ED80, uh, Orion ED80 telescope, and it worked fantastic for that. So I tried it with this system here, and it works. <laughs> it works. I'm going to show you some examples coming up. But the question is, what is the difference between broadband and narrowband? Well, I'm going to talk about that right now. So, what is the value between broadband and narrowband? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the visible light spectrum. And in broadband filters, you have the blue, the green, and the red. And well, the, with your eyes, the visual look through a telescope with just an eyepiece or a camera with no uh, uh, different types of filter on it, just a UV IR cut filter and a one-shot color camera looking at the sky, you're going to see the actual colors that your eyes will see, and that's called broadband. And it's broad because it covers a broad area for the red uh, from 700 nanometers down to 600 nanometers, the green uh, almost 600 down to 500, and the blue uh, from uh, uh, 500 to 400. So the shorter the uh, wavelength, the uh, higher the frequency or the different colors of the light. So there you have the, the blue light, the green light, and red light. How do you remember? Remember all these different colors? Well, one easy way to do that is to remember this fictitious guy's name, Roy G. Biv, R-O-Y-G-B-I-V, Roy G. Biv. That's the color spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, a blue, indigo, and violet. And there you have them right across the board right here. But with, with the um, narrow band, it's a little bit different. Let me explain, first of all, by showing a, an example here. Here I have a picture or, or an example of a proton of a nucleus of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And uh, let's just say this is a, a um, nucleus of hydrogen, which is probably a proton and a neutron fused together. And then you have the lone electron, one electron and one nucleus, uh, a, a proton and a neutron. So. The electron wants to stay around here, kind of close to its, its center, but, but not in the center. And it's, it's floating around somewhere in what's called a shell. Now, if radiation from a nearby star or explosion or something uh, 
falls upon this atom, the electron will absorb a lot of that energy and shoot out to the next shell. Uh, and if it receives even more, it'll go out to another shell and that'll be even uh, further away. Now, once the energy levels uh, recede, the electron goes back to its original shell and then the, the uh, closest shell back to the atom where it wants to be. It wants to be in this position here. Now, in the process, when it's from like this shell here going to this shell here, it gives off a frequency of light right around 653 nanometers in that ballpark there. That's red light. That's why hydrogen alpha is so important because the, uh, the uh, light spectrum given off when the electron goes from this shell back to its initial shell gives off that frequency of light. Same thing happens with oxygen, except there's three electrons involved. And with sulfur, there's two electrons involved. And that gives off the different colors of light. So when we look at the light spectrum over here, with the narrow band, you have, instead of all these broad colors being uh, uh, passed through to the telescope, only these narrow bands are passing through with each filter. Now the sulfur two filter, just a narrow band of this darker red. Uh, for the hydrogen alpha, the most abundant element in the universe, uh, this band right here is still in the red, but leaning a little bit more toward the orange. And then you have all the way over here, the oxygen three, which is in that indigo or getting into blue. And then that uh, other hydrogen uh, released from the second shell outward, I believe, uh, is the hydrogen beta uh, beam of light. And you sometimes get that. That's in the, even the darker blue. Now, this area between oxygen three and hyd uh, hydrogen alpha uh, is basically light pollution. <laughs> that, all that light is light pollution. And it's greatly amplified, obviously, uh, by the full moon, or also if you're in bright city lights, uh, high bordal areas, a lot of this light gets through into your telescope, down to into your camera sensor, and then washes out all the information you're trying to see from the light from oxygen three, hydrogen alpha, and sulfur two. So the broadband filters are good, red, green, and blue, uh, but the narrow band gives off a much better image and much more precise information. So the first thing that I do is I go into Nina and make my flats and I go to the flat wizard, which makes it very easy. And I'm using dynamic exposure, using an artist uh, light board for my light, light source. I have it on medium low. And then I just check on the uh, filters I want to be uh, used for my flats and dark flats. And once these values are set up, you're ready to go. And you just set them for each different filter. And they're usually fairly close to the same of values is and the wizard will do the rest for you and then you just hit go so the next thing i want to do is start taking the image and nina is doing that for me and look at the tracking i'm down to 0 0.70 seconds of arc not bad at all anything below a minute uh, i do is, is fairly well but i like to keep it below eight tenths and now it's down to 0 0.70 and uh, i'm dropping just below 0.7 now 0.69 there's the first image Look how clean that is. Uh, that's the H alpha of the Rosette Nebula. And uh, the tracking was superb as uh, far as, as, as I'm concerned, uh, 0 0.69. And look how round those stars are. This was a, a five minute, 300 seconds uh, image right there. So that's, that's some really good looking uh, tracking going on right there. So let's go through the rest of the night and then stack all these up together. And let's take a look at the uh, final image or images in this case. All right, here's, here we go into Pix and Sight, and here, there's a view of the Rosette Nebula I took on December 17th with the Orion Eon Telescope in broadband using a one-shot color camera, however, using the Optolong filters, which cuts down on some of the, well, a lot of the uh, visible light pollution. So keep that in mind. That's the broadband view, which is not a bad view at all. Um, they're good, but I want to show you the uh, information coming in on the narrow band and this was um, uh, two nights ago and this was the sulfur 2 which i ended up mapping to the red color into the image combination and here's the ha which i mapped into the green and then the o3 which i mapped into the blue this is known as sho or the hubble palette 
and uh, from that you can get different uh, views. So I want to go another route from last night uh, with the uh, reducer on. Uh, you can see, by the way, the reducer shows um, not bad. I mean, it, it works. I mean, a little bit off. I had the I had the um, uh, distance not quite exactly 55 millimeters from the sensor uh, to the uh, reducer uh, lens, uh, uh, but not bad. I mean, the convenience though was really good. Uh, it was very easy to put on versus taking the whole telescope basically apart and putting it back together again, then reconnecting the focuser and, and all the rewrapping the wires and so forth. A little bit off over here, uh, but all in all, not bad at all. Of course, in the center, it's great. It, it, you can crop it a little bit if you had to, but anyway, uh, there you have the um, HA, and then for the uh, O3, uh, a lot of uh, blue coming in. Uh, this is the oxygen three level, which is that blue light, and then here you have the the uh, S2, uh, the darker red light. So when I put all these together, let's uh, let's just minimize this and go into LRGB combination, and then just bring them all together. Uh, into the SHO or the Hubble palette. So I have the sulfur map to the red, the hydrogen alpha map to the green, and there was a lot of hydrogen alpha in there. So you're going to see a lot of green in this final image. And then, of course, the oxygen three going into the blue. So let's see what the results are coming up. There it is. As mentioned, a lot of green in this picture right here. But that's expected because of that uh, a large amount of um, hydrogen alpha. I mean, there was a lot of hydrogen alpha color in there or, 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 or brightness. But going in pics and sight, just going into the SCNR and just knocking out that green, I just average neutral and the 100% or all of the green, just knock it out. There we go. And as Gomer Pyle would say, jazam. <laughs> Look at that difference. Now, look at all that purple, though. There's an easy way of getting rid of that, too, using the same function. Purple, when you invert it, is green. So just go into image and then image uh, invert right here or control I on the keyboard, and that'll invert the image. See all that green there? All right, let's just take it out. Do that. And done. And then uh, go back to image or control I uh, on your keyboard. And there you have it. Isn't that nice? Beautiful uh, picture right, th right there. So, but I don't stop right there. We have these new functions on Pixinsight with the um, uh, Blur Exterminator and the Star Exterminator uh, in use now. And um, let's take a look at that. Over here, here is the final results that I put together in Photoshop after taking the images out of here. Um, and then going into Photoshop, and that's my final image right there uh, in the SHO. Uh, I might have gone a little crazy on the reds over here, but you know the, the original picture was red, and uh, here it is right here. Uh, that's the original picture in a broadband right there. Uh, so you know I wanted to bring in some of that red, but the blues, wow, showing all that oxygen in here and so forth. These are new stars being born right here new creation. All right, what about the, um, uh, you can combine the different palettes. That's something else nice about broadband, I mean, versus a narrow band. On narrow band, you can take the different um, uh, filters and, and mix them up. For example, another very widely used um, combination of the palette is HOO, hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen. And here's what I have with that, right? This picture here. I mean, that's worthwhile in itself, too. I mean, look at the, the details and everything coming out of that. When you zoom in, look at the details. on the, This is about a three and a half hour image. Excuse me, uh, six and a, six, two, four, six, six. Yeah, a little bit over six, almost seven hours worth of data on this image right here uh, in the uh, HOO. SHO was also the same. Well, I just thought, what would it look like if I combined these two together, 50-50? And I blended them together. That's the a blend of the two. So you know the question is, which one do you like better? I mean, they all look great, but you got the the blend of the H O O and the S H O. There you have the H O O, and there you have the S H O. So anyway, 
broadband versus narrowband. They both look good, but I will go for the narrowband any day. Uh, the narrowband, once you start using monochrome cameras, it's hard. To, it's like eating a bag of Lay's potato chips. You just can't eat one. You just got to go back. Well, if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. That always helps. And if you have any comments, yeah, please feel free to make your comments and put them in the comment sections below. I answer all the comments uh, that are given to me. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I, I don't know which one I like best. That that one with the blend of the uh, the H O O and the uh, S H O. That looks really good. I, I really like. Actually, I like all three of them. And uh, so, which one do you like the best? Yeah, let me know. Put your comments in there at the bottom as well. So, you know, remember, the heavens are filled with majestic wonders, all in a sky near you. So, unless you need rain or if you want snow, and right now, who wants snow? Clear skies, everyone.